Ensign Revick's dad vanished shortly after his birth. His mother vanished when he was just three. He was brought up by the crew of Outpost 37 on the edge of Federation space amidst the tumultuous changes that define the setting, the encroachment of Cardassians and Ferengi, and the political reshaping of the United Federation of Planets and Starfleet. He was handy with worker bee controls before he entered primary school, which he found tedious, he was less fond of the tutor that Vulcan sent out to teach him the Vulcan traditions of logic and discipline. At Starfleet Academy, he lived the life of a cocky ace pilot who was uninterested in the academia, which was really just a prerequisites for him getting back behind the helm of a real starship. His senior year training cruise was a midshipman's berthing on the USS Bozeman, where he met Commander Tavel, an experienced Vulcan officer who took Revik under his wing. With Tavel's mentoring, uh, Revik straightened up somewhat and after graduation landed one of the cushiest assignments in the fleet, helmsman for the museum ship USS Enterprise NX-01. One day, when they were leaving Telar's orbit, he saw an opportunity to save 10% of the ship's impulse budget on a slingshot around another world in the system. He miscalculated and crashed the NX-01. No lives were lost in some part, uh, there we go, okay, in some part due to his piloting skills, but the ship itself was totaled. One of the first uh, responders was Delana, an Ngozian and then senior at Starfleet Academy. In the ensuing unscheduled uh, suborbital decommissioning of the first Starship Enterprise found another Academy senior, Tall, to be instrumental to their efforts. We'll meet both of them later. Revik was grounded and given a posting as an unassigned officer on Memory Alpha, a terrestrial command with one pair of rarely used shuttles. That's where he starts the campaign. This is Morning Perfect Base, and I'm not working on my perfect base today. I'm still prepping this ocean monument for me and some comrades to clean it out. I've already kind of cleaned it out because I forgot there was an Elder Guardian in this top room. Sorry, but uh, currently I'm stuck in uh, my own safe room here. Uh, but I'll get out, clean up this top room, and then make another portal and get all this shit squared away. I am talking a little bit more about Star Trek Taiwan, the fate-based Star Trek RPG I ran with the guys uh, a few years back. Last time I talked about the setting, and today I am covering the player characters. I opted to make Revic the campaign's main character. Everyone else would have stories and character arcs, of course, but Revik's player, his player, uh, how do I put this? He is a big fan of Joseph Campbell. If, if that tells you anything, he enjoys conventional narratives, if you follow me. He is one parking lot and one pair of sunglasses away from making videos in his car bashing Joe Biden. So I made him the main character, who has a personal stake in investigating the central thing of the setting, the disappearance of humanity. He was also the player who, I don't know if I ever told anyone else this, volunteered to be in Starfleet's new operations division, which is which is not the guys who fix the ships division. It's very much the guys who fix elections division, uh, secret police division, uh, section 31 division. So tall. One thing I liked about the MechWarrior 2 role-playing game, maybe the only thing I liked about it, was its use of career path tables. Now, I'm sure other RPGs use those, but MechWarrior 2 was my first experience with it. I also wanted to degenericize the process of fate character creation, where you select a pyramid of skills at will. I let players do that if they wanted to, but I also gave them a, a single rank skill bonus for each training path they chose to reflect their time at Starfleet Academy, underclass, upper class, and senior training. Most players chose one of each and they took their bonus skill ranks. Tall's player stopped during his character creation. He stopped and he asked about a specific senior training option, the Cleon Warrior Program. <laughs> I laugh because it's a good idea. Every every member nation has to contribute to Starfleet, but no one wants to send their best and brightest to a, a frivolous non-military. The Cleon Warrior Program allowed low-born Cleons or aspiring Remans or hell, even Cardassians to join, go through testing by Cleons, and if they pass to the trials, 
become warriors of the House of Dwarf, not a respected house at the time, but entitled to the honors of a warrior. It's, it's a dangerous training program. Cadets die. But Tall joined as a Ferengi. When he was a kid, he did an internship under a daemon named Dek. Dek was a good captain. He made a lot of profits. He treated them, his staff, like full-time employees instead of contract workers, and he never paid his interns. Sure, it was about money, but it was also about the principle of giving his crew opportunities and experience that could make them wealthy one day. He was a model Ferengi that made Tall proud to be a Ferengi. It was Tall's experience with the deck that made him want to join Starfleet, receive a free education, and then retire at the 15-year mark to run a luxury shuttle program in the Cleon Empire while receiving a Starfleet pension. It's an untapped market. And Tall joined the Cleon Warrior Program as a scam, right? There's going to be a betting pool on when he washes out, and when he inevitably drops out, at a time of his choosing, he splits the proceeds with an intermediary who placed the bet on his behalf. And he gets a Klingon language credit. It's, it's wins all around. Just to be clear, Tall does not want to be a Klingon warrior. He just needs to last a little bit longer than everyone thinks he will. For the Latinum. The day finally comes. He just passed the rite of ascension. It was hell. I mean, they're called pain sticks. They're sticks that make pain. Then he gets this communique. Fate uses a small list of aspects to give player characters narrative qualities not covered by skills. This one is called O Daemon My Daemon. An accident on his Marauder killed a Daemon deck, and his vacuum desiccated remains were reserved for his former crew before being made available to the public. It was an amazing investment opportunity. After having his broker arrange the asset flip, Tall resolved to stick it out, to make Deck proud, to be motivated by more than just money. He completed the program, and if Deck knew, it would have made him proud. Tall suffered permanent injuries for it. He took life-threatening injuries, and on many occasions, a soft ear and a quick hand on his doctog saved his life from his own teachers. He is entitled to wear a Cleon uniform, and every time he does, there is a fight about it. Tall even wins a few of them, but Tall doesn't back down. He doesn't care for honor, and he's driven by something beyond Latinum, even if he doesn't know what that is yet. Tall's path crossed with Revix when he was assigned as part of the NX-01 salvage operation. Little does he know that the Ferengi House of Zents had a hand in Daemon Deck's death, or that Deck was in communication with rebels like Thaven Tofoci. We'll meet Thaven and a member of the House of Zents later, but that's, that's all for Tall for now. Delana, about uh, 50 years before the setting takes place, and Gosians were drawn into the Tarsian War. They were desperate for good soldiers, and in their desperation, they created a crash program of cybernetic implants, chemical treatments, and psychological conditioning to create super soldiers. The program was wildly successful, but the integration of those soldiers back into their society after the war was much more difficult. Delana served in the Tarsian War, and her reintegration was difficult. She earned her MD on Angosia after the war, but found that her status as a veteran meant very few of her own people trusted her to treat them. She could have taken her MD and rank from the war and transferred directly into Starfleet as a senior petty officer or a chief, but she opted to apply for Starfleet Academy's medical program and serve as an officer. In the mostly demilitarized Starfleet, she's free to practice medicine, but there are several officers eager to drag her back into combat and leadership roles. During her senior year, she happened to be on a civilian vessel that was one of the first to respond to the crash of the NX-01. Her preparation of a civilian vessel for the crash contributed to the accident's lack of casualties. And the away team's first mission, which has all of our player characters in it, uh, it's a noodle incident which takes place after the first session. Uh, that mission saw her trick a monstrous, aggressive indigenous life form into focusing on her before she neutralized it. The, uh, the away team's behavior was a large cause of that uh, incident. 
and there were other problems on the mission, but Revik's talent for quick talking saved them from any serious repercussions. Uh, the guy kind of knows how to get on with authority, uh, in par partially because he does get into so much trouble, but also because he's very good at manufacturing that veneer of respectability. Delana's senior training program was the Officer's Hermitage, which is where she met Aishan. And we'll see Aishan in the Officer's Hermitage later. Delar. Delar is a Ferengi from the House of Zents, a corporation run by the family matriarch. Technically the family patriarch, but uh, his mom is uh, a strong character. Uh... His player know well, his player knew it's Derek from the Beige and the Bold. At the time, he knew nothing about Star Trek, and I suspect Delar was a bit of a troll, which is cool. I built the campaign around that kind of thing. Delar was a Ferengi officer in the diplomatic division, which includes logistics, and he did not care about work at all. My well, one of my favorite Dolar moments was when he was charged with giving a briefing to the crew going on shore leave about the dangerous political climate of the planet and summarized all of it, which I'd written out, I'd written out the whole thing. Uh, he's just like, hey, good luck, have fun, before leaving so he could be the first guy on shore leave. King. I regret I couldn't do more with all of these player characters, but Delar has a special place in my heart. Delar's, Delar's big thing is that he has a life debt from a Cleon. The exact words used were different, but it's... It's like a fucking Wookiee, okay? I, but, you know, whatever. Cleons can do that, too. I was committed to saying yes to things for this campaign. Tumek owes him a life debt. In Fate, everybody's backgrounds are supposed to interlink. But I, I checked my notes. I can't find where anyone else's background linked to this one. I mean, look, reviewing every... All the data I have on this Enterprise borders on archaeology, so I'm not going to worry about it too much. It's just a weird thing. Uh, the House of Zents is his family's trade corporation, is known for having a long reach within Ferengi space and even outside of it. The reach there, uh, conceptually, is a house of Ferengi more than a woman running a corporation, but you know, marketing. I, I do have to talk about Star Trek Deep Space Nine, so mild spoilers for Star Trek Deep Space Nine. At the end of Deep Space Nine, the Ferengi have neoliberal reforms, and the Cardassians have a good reason to abandon their fascistic ways. The Cardassians were never powers in the Quadrant, and the Ferengi reforms were accomplished by turning off the misogyny and greed pills in their water supply, I guess. Or waving a magic wand. We don't know for sure. I mean, I do know it was bad storytelling. So, I, I, mean, I mean, they started taxation. How were there not riots? So anyway, they're... They're still Ferengi, but women can do business and wear clothes sometimes, and men can go naked sometimes. But usually it's the Ferengi we know. Usually it's also the Cardassians we know. I'm sorry, I had to compromise on this one, you know. If there is Star Trek continuing stuff from after Deep Space Nine in the Alpha Quadrant, like the Cardassians should be completely different from what we know. They're not going to be, but they should be. They, 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 they took it right, right in the face. So... Anyway, uh, oh, oh, another Dolar scene before I move on. He has an NPC Tellarite friend, and we traded friendly insults while role-playing his Starfleet Academy graduation reception, and then his naked mom came up and congratulated him while needling him about his brother's successful garbage scout business. It was great. Who's next? Thaven Tofochi. Thaven's player wanted to play an Andorian, so I watched for the first time all of the Star Trek Enterprise episodes with the Andorians. I uh, especially like the one where the Vulcans were hiding a military outpost in a mosque. Uh, I'm sorry, I mean a Vulcan temple. I apologize. Sometimes I forget 9-11. I mean, sometimes I don't, I don't remember things about episodes. <sighs> Fucking Enterprise. His player was the second most Star Trek person in the group, and they had a hate on. I suspect they had a hate on uh, for the new state of the Federation in this setting, which was reflected in their character's disdain for Cardassian oppression. And that, that was delicious. I love that. I love that investment. If you hate something about the setting, but in a constructive way, right, where you can say, okay, the universe is big and I hate it, 
what small thing can I do to, to punch back against the universe? That's a good thing. And it's a fine line. I don't, I, I was fortunate that if that's how he felt, that he chose to channel that constructively in a way that was interesting for his, his character. Thaven was a mediocre cadet and he smuggled an Ushan tour on campus to use a, on a Cardassian supremacist. Dolar actually helped as his lack of any principle made him happy to uh, fleece an ideologue for some Latin. Unfortunately, Thaven's activities and attempts at covering his trail caught the attention of Tall, who was studying communications analytics at the time. Tall discovered Thaven's plan and, unbeknownst to the Andorian, ratted him out to the authorities. Despite being hot-headed and righteous, actually works with rebel elements who want to restore the old federation. The plan is that he would occasionally be pulled into low-level espionage for anti-federation projects, um, much in the same way that Revik would be pulled into those same kind of projects for pro-federation ends. His senior training was the same officer's hermitage as Delana for very different reasons. And finally, we have Aishan. Uh, Aishan is a Romulan and former Borg. They call them ex-Borg or ex-Bs these days because if you abbreviate stuff, your universe allegedly feels lived in, or at least the producers of Star Trek Picard think so. You didn't think you were getting out of this without a Star Trek Picard knock, did you? Aishan was recovered from the Borg during a different noodle incident. As humans began vanishing, Admiral Janeway led a coalition of vessels, Starfleet, Cleon, Romulan, and others into an incursion to the near Delta Quadrant to put a halt to the Borg as a threat for the immediate future. During that operation, they recovered a significant amount of Borg technology and a number of drones. Still, Aishan, like others rescued that day, is stigmatized because of her Borg implants. She's transporter whiz and a fine Starfleet security officer. When Starfleet Academy wants to get rid of or shake loose bad cadets, their last resort is the officer's hermitage. Ostensibly, it is a senior training program, but they're dropped on the Rio Grande planet. Yes, the barely habitable world that's the California mountains with a blue filter from Deep Space Nine's The Ascent. They're given a few supplies and a comm badge that only calls for help to one ship in orbit, and using it will result in their failing the training and out of Starfleet Academy. Aishan, Delana, and Thaven all did this. Delana thought it was a legitimate training exercise because she's the love child of Chuck Norris and Ed 209. Thaven was violent and actively called out the corruption uh, of the modern federation, so he was voluntold for it. And Aishan was an XB, and that was enough to get her assigned to it. She was in Revik's graduating class and missed the boat out at the end of the training. She survived for a year, presumed dead, until she linked up with the next year's class and passed alongside them. Her aspect is, I saved all but two at Crystal Glacier, which helps her keep her team alive and together, but also means that she gets drawn into a situation where she tries to save everyone. Not that I can use that drawback to compel her into a story hook because she's an NPC. Aishan is just a storyteller character who's there to give detail about the setting and occasionally be a free set of hands for the player characters. So, given that Revik, Tall, and Delana are top performers assigned to the USS Enterprise, NCC-1701F, and that Dolar, Thaven, and Aishan are pariahs and underachievers assigned to the USS Taiwan, how do they all end up together? Next time I talk about Star Trek Taiwan, I'll cover the pilot in Season 1. Until then, keep learning, keep asking questions, and keep making good art.